while we were recording, I got a text message from one of my uh, clients who has retired saying, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I'm watching the news. The city of Atlanta needs you. Go down there. <laughs> the city of Atlanta needs you. <laughs> I'm like, ah, ah. <laughs> She thought she was funny. Because <laughs> she is. <laughs> she knows I ain't doing that. You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and securityfirstit.com. And joining me is Donna Grindle of CardenHQ.com. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's getting a little bit, you're getting about, more comfortable. How about that? that? I plugged them both. <laughs> Dot com. There you go. So uh, we have, have officially, this time for real, ended up <laughs> done with the <laughs> HIPAA boot camp. Uh, one of the guys that was there yesterday said, since I had already announced the HIPAA boot camp was over <laughs> and it went well, <laughs> that he felt compelled to make it go sideways. <laughs> Create a disturbance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I don't care who you are. Yeah. Uh, it, it was great. It was it was a, you know a lot of good interaction. Particularly the longer it went on, I think everybody became more comfortable with uh, that. But uh, we're we're gonna look for their feedback on the virtual version of the uh, boot camp. Mm-hmm. We'll see what we do next. But we do have to figure out. I think I have three people now in line for another live one. Cool. And, and you know, I don't know who else might join for a live one, but we have three people that have uh, a need. So we'll see what we do. Cool. So shout out to uh, Sarah. I won't use her last name because she didn't tell me I could use anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she left a, uh, a awesome review on our, on our Facebook page. And, uh, she also sent me a message after I said, thank you so much. Donna can be proud that we got something. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> so she said, thank you for the podcast. They're truly helpful and make me feel that I'm not completely alone in this hectic compliance world. So uh, she also hopes to attend one of our uh, boot camps one of these days. So that would be great. Bring it on. Yeah. Come on, Sarah. Let us know. Yep. So she don't live around here, so it'll take a little yeah. bit <laughs> to get her here. But um, anyway, that'd be great. So that does remind me to remind you as a listener, hey, we get uh, paid with uh, reviews. <laughs> so, That's it. So go review us and help us out. And um, and if you just can't do that and you just have to throw money at us, then that helps us keep the lights on as well. And you can do that at helpmewithhippa.com slash give. You can do a one-time gift or a recurring monthly gift. Either way, we appreciate it. Yay. Yeah. Well, we're kind of mellow today. We're worn out. I yeah. Think. We had the uh, boot camp all last week and this week. And so, um, actually. And then our we've been talking for over an hour before we started recording. <laughs> and our conversations are so wide and varying, no one would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think about what we've talked about. No, let's don't. <laughs> <laughs> let's don't let's don't. <laughs> serious business stuff and then a lot of not serious business stuff too it's pretty equal <laughs> so uh, uh in keeping with the format <laughs> yes. where, where are you okay. going to be coming up here shortly well this one is uh the first episode coming out in april so i'm running up on my april events uh the end of the month so the jaw society we've got everything booked we're real excited about going out and working with those guys and we're going to see the Sphere guys when we're out there, so that's exciting. April 22nd through the 25th in Newport Beach, Cali. It's going to be fun. going to spend a couple of nights on the Queen Mary before I go to the conference at Long Beach. Then we get back home just in time to go to Savannah uh, for the Georgia MGMA conference. I will have to you know, have a little nap in between the two party times. And uh, then in June, I've already locked in with the North Georgia Medical Management Association up in Dalton. I'm doing a a seminar with those guys. We just did a webinar with them. But, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of this, I don't even have time to publish anymore. (laughs) Mm, I know. Yeah, it's great, though. I mean, we got people talking to us about speaking uh, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, I'm having to decide when I can do that versus other stuff. So, you know, work. Right. Well, we hate that kind of stuff, but, you know, it pays the bills. Yeah, got to do it. (laughs) 
So in today's episode, we're going to dive into more cybersecurity stuff because guess what? You can never talk about it enough. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about the law stuff the last few episodes and, and uh, the interview with Mitzi, uh, I was just, you know, it, it was, I, you know, I couldn't even think of what to say. She was just nailing it as far as I was concerned. And uh, so I really appreciate her taking the time to be with us. And uh, David was under attack by helicopters during the episode, so he, <laughs> he missed some of it. <laughs> if you, uh, so if you listen in, the, in an audio editor didn't do his due diligence, then you might hear helicopters in the background. I didn't know, wasn't sure if like it was a life flight or, you know, I was being attacked or I don't know what it was, but it sounded like, honestly sounded like it was hovering over my house for like five minutes. <laughs> I didn't hear any of it. So hopefully it's all good. Uh, Donna's but, like, they found your field. They found your field. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, I promise you it's corn. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Let's just, let's just go uh, let that one roll. So, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> Oh, so, yeah. anyhow, uh, <laughs> this episode, uh, I got overwhelmed with the reports, and uh, I just and they when they all talk to me the same way, I have to jam them together because I can't decide the message any other way. Yeah. So yeah, OCR uh, in their January newsletter talked about the rising incidents and cyber extortion, and and then uh, we've also had a report that came out from Cisco. And I love going through these reports, and and you always do a great job pulling the information out and all the pretty graphs and stuff. So we'll cover we'll cover what all that stuff means. Yeah, but another thing, and I thought about trying to make a whole episode on this, but I, other than the fact that you and I would just be like, "Wow, I can't believe this," I couldn't make a whole episode about it. But it is it falls in line with this whole cyber extortion is more than ransomware, and people don't get that. Mm-hmm. You know. It's going beyond things like the hackers that are blackmailing you to keep it quiet. You've been hacked. Like, oh, I don't know, Uber. <laughs> uh, don't know why that comes to mind. But there's another case that in Minnesota, an ex-employee actually hired hackers to do one of those attacks on their former employer, on his former employers. Hmm. And uh, not not in necessarily healthcare. It was more of a technology kind of thing, but was out on the dark web hiring hackers to attack the employer who apparently they did not separate well. (laughs) One would think he may have had a problem with how they separated. (laughs) (laughs) But just the fact that, you know, people forget that it doesn't just mean that these uh, random hackers find you. You can be targeted and you will be targeted and, and it could be insiders we keep bringing that up for a reason well speaking so, of being targeted and and you know late breaking news <laughs> what's going on in your area <laughs> well the atl uh, you know <laughs> good lord the breaking news atlanta's under attack and i'm like what because <laughs> i live here I, i'm not hearing anything and uh it, you know once you get past all of the craziness of the news breaking news people who don't understand it it was a ransomware attack probably sam sam based on what they're saying i don't know but uh like you know i'm i'm watching the (laughs) i should have i told i told you as as i told you earlier i I should have changed the channel but it was a train wreck i couldn't look away (laughs) from yeah you know the, the the broadcasters the the i don't understand how atlanta could allow this to happen and they bring in an ex-hacker, and this guy's just trying to get hired places, I can tell. And he had good information. He was just delivering it all around how he should be hired, and this wouldn't happen. Um, and between the two of them, it, you know, it's it, we both know, more than likely, statistically, it happened because somebody opened a phishing email, mm-hmm. you know, and... and uh, or logged into something or any of those kind of things. And then they're having a fit because why are they telling uh, people to protect their personal information? Why would personal information be on the city? Because they pay people. <laughs> they pay people. That's what these hackers go after. They lock down the things that you think. And this was like, yeah, because of you. 
Well, the initial uh, request is like $50,000, but now that they know it's the city of Atlanta, you can count on them asking for more. Yeah. Cause you, <laughs> <laughs> Might should have kept yeah. that under wraps for now. <laughs> well, it's not just that, but they were publishing like, we have gotten access to the ransom note. <laughs> First of all, you know, this is why you don't hand them out because the the ransomware, uh, we'll call it vendor, uh, <laughs> knows what their notes look like and they all are not the same. So that would then let them know, hey, I'm going to go figure out which one's them and jack up the price and not give them the key and all these kind of things. So it was kind of kind of haphazard and in a lot of ways it, it was screaming we're clearly not educating enough people, David. Yeah. Well, it also goes to an organization and their ransomware slash breach response. And, yeah. And how are they going to handle the media side of things? You know, I don't know. Maybe you do. I don't know if this involves Hitler or not. I don't know if they're a self-insured organization. Uh, from what they're talking about that was hit, I don't think so. And the city of Atlanta, I doubt, is self-insured. Could, I mean, you talk about a mess. <laughs> and and there's a brand new mayor who clearly doesn't understand too much of it either. And uh, it's a mess. Granted, it's a mess. And they're going to have problems just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to tell at this time. Obviously, we'll know pretty quickly if they had a response plan in place. It'll be obvious. Yeah. The way they're handling the PR sounds like not at least part of that. You know, that's just not being handled. The message wasn't decided on properly. You can tell just by the way uh, the response to the uh, press briefing went. Yeah. So it only reiterates the points in these uh, reports and the newsletter is that this is becoming a huge thing. Yeah. And it's, you know, we talk about this and we talked about this a ton during the boot camp, which is... It's all about the training, training the end users. Um, I mean, there's only so much you can do for, from a technology standpoint. And uh, you and I both have things that we sell to companies to um, simulate phishing and and test the end users and see how educated they are at picking out things and not clicking on stuff. And, you know, honestly, this, this should be something that every single organization is doing because if you're not training and you're not testing, you, then you have no idea how your your end users are, are doing with these things. And you can either spend a little bit of money to train and test, or you can spend a bunch of money when something like this happens. <laughs> well, and, and it will limit the damage in most cases because people are more aware and they'll put more things in place. Right. But you're right that, uh, <laughs> you know, at some point, I am sure in the distant past, people learned to lock the door. (laughs) (laughs) And that when you leave the house, you must lock the door and take a key with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, you know, we can not necessarily take a key and lock the door remotely, which I'd love to do. All of those kind of things and everything happens automatically, but we still at some point had to learn the importance of locking the door. Well, it's time for us to learn to lock the door. You still, even if you lock the door, the burglars still would get in if they were determined. And you spent the time, whatever you invested in uh, your protections, you decided your level of risk, and you put protections in place to protect the things in your building. Whether it's your office building or your house, you protected those things accordingly, and we continue to do that. We've got to use that same approach with our networks and our data. Mm-hmm. And and if these reports are even slightly true, as far as the predictions and the evaluations they've done, the accuracy is highly probable based on the um, sources. You're not getting a lot of random tainted sources on these. These are pretty big names. I don't know about you, but it certainly makes you think about living off the grid uh, when you're... <laughs> Yeah. Well, it goes back to the a lot of the frustration that you know we in the IT community have is that people don't really understand that they're walking around either in their hand or using at work 
uh, a, a weapon of sorts, you know, mm-hmm. and you you don't know how to secure the weapon. Most of you don't even know how to use it other than, a, hey, I can pull up and type a letter. But you just don't understand the power of what you have at your availability. And and because of that, then you don't give it a lot of uh, attention for, with security. <laughs> yeah, attention, yeah. <laughs> it's a... Uh... And get attention. So let's let's go over some of this and why, you know, the, the o, uh, OCR newsletter was discussing the different ways of uh, cyber extortion and the growing um, use of it by criminals, and that uh, we should uh, consider it as a risk and things that we needed to worry about. This uh, report by Cisco, they in their summary. That what they have done is they did a study over the last 12 to 18 months and looked at where things are moving and how things are changing. And uh, they are urging organizations to pay attention to what's going on. And this quote that uh, they specifically put in here, this is what is in the report. And I thought, eh, that really goes with what David just said. By dismissing what seemed like distant campaigns, or allowing the chaos of daily skirmishes with attackers to consume their attention, defenders fail to recognize the speed and scale at which adversaries are amassing and refining their cyber weaponry. I like it. That alone is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. So we're worried about the little things, and you don't realize this is an army being built. In fact, it's multiple armies that can be aimed at any business, or person in the world. Like the Dark Army. Oh, no, don't start with that. <laughs> but, you know, they are, um, in their trends of what they said, they said over the last year and a half, there's three general themes that they are tracking in the study. The adversaries, I like that they call them adversaries. Yeah, they're not actors anymore. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the bad actors. Adversaries. We just say bad guys. Are taking malware to unprecedented levels of sophistication and impact. Okay, you can stop right there. That goes to, you know, throw out the whole notion that, you know, I know a little kid that's awesome with computers and he can manage my network. Or, you know, I have an employee and they know a little bit about computers so they can do everything on my network and keep it secure. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you have to have professional IT support to secure and maintain the security of your network. And you don't want somebody that just says, yeah, I know about it. Ask them a lot of questions. Ask them if they know us. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, the, I mean, the know, sophistication you listen of to the, the podcast. Tell me what you think. Yeah. The sophistication, of, I mean, it does change so rapidly that, you know, those of us in the IT field, we even struggle sometimes to keep up and combat everything that's happening. So, you know, to, for somebody who's not doing it, full-time, there's just no way they can keep up with what's going on. Yeah, and there's this term, and I, and, and I know that it's one of those where you're like, I don't know whether that means that you're taking a part of the body out <laughs> or it's technology, but it's self-propagating malware. Mm-hmm. And basically what they've been able to do is turn those malware programs, the malicious software programs, into robots that go and attack on their own. Think of it that way. I mean, it's not exactly it, but it's like all the robot needs is a little door that it can get in, and then it replicates itself to attack you and finds its own victims, mm-hmm. if you will. And so now they just release these uh, robots out into the ether, and these things are beginning to self propagate and maybe they'll get in a fight or something. I don't know. But that is the scariest part, that level of sophistication. And then, of course, the impact is because they can do this, they're able to have a much bigger impact in their victims' um, and technology. So, and, and in their point there, they're becoming more adept at evasion and weaponizing cloud services and other technology that's legitimate. So they're uh, encapsulating their little bad boy stuff in the middle of a bunch of good stuff. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell that it's in there. And they're using the word weaponizing. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that kind of goes back yeah. to what I said earlier. They don't realize, yeah. <laughs> people don't realize what like, they have. 
I know you didn't read it this closely and plan that. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly didn't write that that was a weapon. I hadn't thought of it that way before, but it clearly... Um, these are being turned against us. And the other part is adversaries are exploiting undefended gaps in security, many of which stem from the expanded Internet of Things and use of cloud services. Mm -hmm. And how many times are we going to talk about that? You know, in our first, one of our first episodes, we did the uh, episode Rise of the Machines the Internet of Things, and trying to explain that to people. And hard to believe we're almost uh, three years into uh, this podcast in May. It'll be, yeah, I don't know how that's <laughs> happened. But <laughs> we saw, you know, what was coming, and it is uh, seriously proliferating. That was uh, episode 28. Was it? Yep. Well, you're, you're quick. I know. Spot. <laughs> so... <laughs> Basically, they're saying these are tools and weapons now that the bad guys are developing, and uh, they're exponentially sophisticated, and the damage, even without a person having to be involved in launching the attacks, because they're able to find them themselves, the computers are, and, you know, and I get to say nefarious. <laughs> <laughs> Ways to hide their nefarious activity within legitimate activity. That's a, that's a big problem right there. And it gets, you know, how do we find it? How do we see it as, as technical people? You're going to start picking apart the legitimate activity. You're going to decrypt it because their traffic is encrypted just like the good traffic now. Yeah. And then the IoT, I mean, how many times do we hear somebody put Alexa somewhere and we're like, you have her where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, a smart TV, they terrify me. You know, mine doesn't, I have a smart TV. I, could, I got it turned off, The it, its ability to connect. I, I don't want it smart anymore. <laughs> well, we talked about this, you know, in the boot camp as well, where there's just so many things connected to the internet that people don't even realize what they are anymore. I mean, it's like your watch is connected, your, I don't know, your shoes are probably connected, who knows. But, uh, you know, now that you have digital signage, that's, you know, everybody's putting in their business to advertise things. And, you know, these people are, these vendors are coming in. They're going, hey, I just need to connect this to your network so I can, you know, send these advertising panels to the TV. And they're like, okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Digital signage, all this kind of stuff. And people don't think anything about it. And it's the way in. Even if the people that are putting it in aren't intending to do anything wrong, the problem is no one's worrying about the security of those devices. No, they just want to sell their device. All right, so the next report, after we've gone through and we can see that Cisco is saying, hey, these things are happening, they've got some great statistics, and we'll include a, a couple of their graphs and charts that I saw in these reports, and particularly the information that uh, in the Cisco report that included the top, 10 malicious file extensions. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's Office files and zips. It, I mean, if you were to quit opening Microsoft Office files <laughs> and zipped files, your statistical uh, likelihood of launching these m malware attacks, uh, I mean, 38% of the top 10 were... Office files, 37% were archives. Then you got 14% as PDFs, and everything else is a single digit. Yeah. So as as we move away from utilizing these things to this level, it's certainly highly likely that we could protect ourselves. But people can't stop themselves. They got to click. They yeah. got to click. Well, you could yeah. set up uh, things in your network to block all that stuff, but most people are will it'll drastically decrease how they uh, are able to function because they mm -hmm. tend to send things that are PDFs and office documents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know we have to, and we use Google Docs for a lot of things, but we also use Microsoft documents because, you know, people, you work with whatever your people need you to work with. But, wow, to see that it's that much, but just between the zips and, you know, and the Gmail, with us using the G Suite, it automatically, if you put an EXE even in a zip file, it'll say, nope, I know you're in there. You're not coming out. Mm -hmm. 
and it won't let it go. So you run into that when you want to actually send a legitimate one. <laughs> so on the other report, it uh, it doesn't look any better. Um, so just note, though, that Android is 0% on that report. Okay, carry on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, It's in the top 10. Is it 0%? And, <laughs> and so is Apple. <laughs> I know. Apple's above Android by two spaces. <laughs> in the 0% list. Okay. That helps me out. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I know. That helps you. I know. You feel so much better. Okay. I'm on, Next. I got an Oreo this morning, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh But on the next report, this is one on global megatrends. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, what they say are the seven megatrends that are problematic for the state of cybersecurity over the next three years. So Cisco is looking at what's been going on and what they see transpiring. And then this report is looking at predictions based on what they're seeing. It, it's the same. So the number one thing, a data breach from an unsecured Internet of Things device in the workplace is predicted to be very likely over the next three years. Okay. Very likely. I mean, like, I think it was like 70, 80% of the people that uh, were responding that are cybersecurity specialists think that's what's going to happen. I agree. No, number two. The risk of cyber extortion and data breaches will increase in frequency. I agree so with that. So those, yeah, the, those news anchors need to learn. We're going to have to call them up. Everybody calm down. <laughs> Number three, and this one made me really think about, as much as we talk about how I've transitioned out of the business of MSPs or managed service providers and how often I am thankful for that, I read this and had another thankful moment. IT security practitioners are more pessimistic about their ability to protect their organizations from cyber threats. Mm -hmm. Boom. Yeah. You know, it's like if people are loading stuff and setting up stuff and doing all these things and you don't even know about it, how are you going to win? Number four, cyber warfare and breaches involving high value information will have the greatest negative impact on organizations over the next three years. Okay, well, we've talked repeatedly about high-value information. And whether they're after healthcare information because they can use it to blackmail people, they can use it for additional warfare activity. And I'm sorry, but the environment we're in right now, the between the trade war discussions and the war war and nuclear and all, information is going to be utilized at a level that we have never even dreamed of. Yeah, but one of the issues, though, is what what we know is high-value information. Some of the people who own that are like, I don't have anything anybody would want. Why would they be messing with me? Yeah. <sighs> you're, if it, if you're doing that, you're part of the problem in a bigger way than you ever dream. Because mm-hmm. you're either part of the problem by being utilized as an attack mechanism because your systems are part of those robots and all of those other things that are going on, or you're just laying it out there for those people that unfortunately have trusted you with their data to give it away. Because if you're not fighting now, you're not going to keep up. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away now. It's a BOGO. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, number five, despite the growing cyber threat, cybersecurity is not considered a strategic priority. Mm-hmm. Amen. Exactly the same thing that Cisco's saying. Mm-hmm. And and we see it as a problem. Boards of directors are not engaged in the oversight of their organization's cybersecurity strategy. Because they don't it's understand like, oh, it. Handle it. Handle it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just don't understand it. So, uh, I mean, yeah. it's kind of the same problems we're seeing with some of the laws that come out, right? These The people that are yeah. passing laws, they have no idea. They don't understand any of it, and they're passing these laws, particularly Georgia. Well, they're not, <laughs> well, they're not passing them. They're, uh, as Mitzi said, it's being political folly. Yeah, that's true. In a lot of cases, but still, it's political folly that clearly you don't understand. If you understood, that wouldn't even be a realistic political folly. <laughs> You're going to tell all these businesses they're out of business. I mean, come on. So then we get to number seven. Companies will have to spend more to achieve regulatory compliance and respond to class action lawsuits and tort litigation. Mm. 
Well, we know that because the previous two tell you <laughs> they're not spending anything on cybersecurity in the beginning, and regulatory compliance is all about securing things. Right. So if they were to spend a little bit of money on number five, they wouldn't have to spend as much money on number seven. <laughs> I know. So, it, you know, if five and six were happening, seven would go away. Right. You know, they're spending more because they haven't spent very much at all on worrying about cybersecurity. And then that's also because you haven't worried about cybersecurity, creating these class actions and the tort litigations and all those things that are happening. So you're spending more on that. And it's, it's, it's in so many ways, self-inflicted wounds. You're taking that computer that makes phone calls and shooting yourself in the foot with it. So, <laughs> but they did, they did say <laughs> that they thought some things would get better over the next three years. Well, it, Sort of, if you, <laughs> it's going to get so bad, things will have to get better. Is <laughs> what yeah, they're saying. Well, that's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> As the threat landscape worsens, organizations will increasingly rely on the expertise of the CISO, which is the Chief Information Security Officer. Thank goodness, finally. Yeah, they're, they're going to have to rely on somebody that understands security. You know, our job is often to be that translator between those boards and and decision makers and the security people. We actually can speak both languages pretty well. And uh, often just being able to translate what the tech people are trying to get across because they are horrible at presenting their, their point and getting it across in a manner that actually makes sense to the management team if we can bridge that gap it's huge and that's where we need to get is where we can rely on that expertise yeah well the another part of that you know for the people who are outsourcing the it so i'll get on my soapbox (laughs) there you go is that you know we as uh security it vendors we're trying to to keep organizations safe and secure and we often get pushback you know, I, I'm dealing with a, a that this week with a, a client who doesn't want antivirus <laughs> because how could you not want antivirus? I don't even go into it, but you know, it's it's not convenient. It's slowing systems down supposedly, and all this, and you know, it's there's a pop up that comes up once a day, and that's annoying. So they don't want it, and and that's just the that's just basic stuff. But you know, security's where, not optional. Rule number two: you tell them you're violating rule number two. Right. And, and it's just you know, stuff like that. It, I, I will be thrilled to death when I don't have to have an argument with somebody when you're trying to do everything in your power to protect them from these things. Yeah. Yeah. It, it gets hard because you got so many people that are wanting you to help. And then you end up in these kind of, uh, it's like you just throw your hands up, but at the same time, you don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Okay, so number two of the things that will get better, cybersecurity governance practices are expected to improve. Well, of course they'll have to. (laughs) And when we talk about governance, we're talking about looking at it as a big picture thing and not just, oh, it's an IT thing. It's talking about identifying all of your valuable information and treating information as a strategic asset and cybersecurity as part of what sets you apart and uh, a very strategic position to be in is a secure one where you actually understand all of the important data that you have and how it's being protected you know but it's still like you know city of atlanta who's supposed to be doing this Mm -hmm. see it you can see everybody like i don't know dude yeah i don't know call that dude over there but With uh, that in mind, many of the respondents who are these cybersecurity folks in organizations, they're optimistic they will be promoted to a better position with greater authority and responsibility, which I found this one kind of interesting because that implies they're expecting to stay around in their jobs. Mm -hmm. And if we have the shortage that we know we have, I mean, you're experiencing it. I know. There's a major shortage in technical people and particularly ones that are in cybersecurity. And that's expected to continue to grow. The the need for them and the amount we're producing is drastically out of whack. So if that continues, how are these people not going to be pilfered? You know, 
it's, it's, it'll start happening where the money will be pulling them away from the jobs they right now intend to be in if they're actually good at cybersecurity is what I'm, I'm concerned about. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, but I thought that was interesting that it seems they're planning on sticking around, but maybe they think that they're going to get promoted by going to another company. I don't know. Companies will invest in enabling security technologies and managed security service providers. Ooh. Hello, David. How about that? As part of their cybersecurity strategy. How long have you been talking about managed security services? <laughs> A long time. As long as we've been talking. I think this is where we're going, Donna. <laughs> um, so they should have, just call me and they can do this whole study without even going through. <laughs> I know, really? <laughs> so it, it is interesting that... Uh, we know that that's going to have to happen. And there are some other studies that show that just throwing money at it will not solve the problem. So we've got to have a balance there. You know, if you buy the most expensive security technology stuff you can ever get, and then you install it, and then you don't train your staff, it really doesn't help. The most helpful thing is extensive training from most of the studies that we've seen. You can have it in combination with other things and make it very helpful, but just throwing money at it is not going to fix it. So, actually making it a strategy, that's where David comes in, right, guy? (laughs) I'm there. Well, we were just talking about you're worried about building that strategy now for a year from now. That's one of the things we're talking about. Yeah. Making sure you're prepared. Yeah. We're we're developing the methodology now that, you know, is not really going to be something people are going to be looking for for another year or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like me trying to get people to talk about HIPAA in 2012, 2013. They swing wide around my booth. <laughs> uh, now everybody comes and parties with me. So companies are expected to improve collaboration and reduce the complexity of business and IT operations. Oh, my gosh. I've been trying to do that forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, why are you making this so hard? I know. The, There's a lot of ways that things could be solved, but it's the way we've always done it problem. Yeah. Well, not only that, but it, you know, I think there was some school of thought that the more complex things are, the harder it would be for somebody to attack you, which really what happens is it's harder to protect <laughs> because it's too sophisticated. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a vicious cycle that we uh, have to go through to break it down so that you can protect it, uh, you need to make it less complicated. And also, get rid of digital clutter. You know, if there's stuff you've got out there and you don't need it, you need to be getting rid of it. Make it less complicated to protect everything. You know, you've got records from 1990-something. I'm pretty sure you don't need all of them. Yeah. At least get them offline. One of the easiest ways to do this is just simply go through your devices and uninstall applications that are not in use. Don't leave them hanging out there. Yeah, and it tells you when's the last time you used them. So, yeah, that needs to happen. So, basically, what they all keep telling us is the attackers are getting better and getting more motivated, and more and more of them are motivated by money because there's billions of dollars being made. That's right, billions And we're just starting to see now how well they can do this. Last year, we started hearing about ransomware as a service. They're building businesses that support the hackers, and you come to them with your list or the place you want to attack and buy their service, and then they take a cut of the money you make. This is a big business. You know, they're turning into an online mob. And it's not something that uh, we can take lightly. And, uh, you know, they're investing in their business. They're taking that billion and billion of dollars and investing it. And the ones that were good at it in the beginning have now started running those software as a service deals. So they're making money while they're helping other people make money. And everybody's moving up the chain. And here's the rest of us. And this is my favorite line that I get to say. Everybody else is acting like they're the queen of denial. (laughs) (laughs) Get it, denial. Anyway. Denial, yeah. But this goes to, (laughs) you know, the analogy I made during the boot camp where, you know, it's it's the equivalent of somebody walking around door to door and they're shaking the doorknobs and they're pushing up on the windows and they're trying to see if they can get in. 
and, and people just aren't aren't doing anything about it. The, the difference is that if I'm doing this in a digital format, then the chances of me getting shot <laughs> are none or very low. And so yeah. I can still break into things and I can still steal and make money and all that. And I don't, you know, it's hard to catch me. Uh, I'm not leaving mm-hmm. fingerprints. I'm leaving digital fingerprints maybe, but it's still harder to catch me. And I don't have to worry about some homeowner, you know, blow, blow my head off while I'm doing it. <laughs> Yeah, or, you know, just the random police or you know, neighborhood watch. There's a million things to worry about when you're individually doing these things. But when you're doing it with a computer, there's no one in the house and you're using the computer that's attached to the internet and sucking their power, maybe even doing uh, the uh, mining. They're using power that you have no idea. All of a sudden, your power bill will go up. It's because you were hacked. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. People don't get what's happening out there. But we do want to make a point that the uh, Poneman report, the other report that was uh, done by Poneman, Poneman, I never know. It's like I know until I need to say it. That uh, that report is being, uh, uh, it was funded by Raytheon. So we always have to make it clear where we're getting our information. But they did do predictions about cyber threats. And of the people they interviewed that were cybersecurity specialists, when they said, what do you strongly agree or agree will be the uh, biggest cyber threats? Number one, 67%. Risk of cyber extortion, such as ransomware, will increase in frequency and payout. Mm. Number two, 66%. My organization will experience a data breach or cybersecurity exploit that will seriously diminish our shareholder value. Ooh. 66%. Think we're going to diminish our value as a business. 60% nation state attacks against government and commercial organizations will worsen and potentially lead to a cyber war. And we don't even know what that is yet. (laughs) And finally, 41% say my organization will be able to minimize IoT risk by requiring the integration of security in the devices we build or use in the workplace. So all you people that are putting these things out here and not worrying about security, it's about time we start worrying about it. And then the other predictions about technologies and practices, this goes back to David's uh, famous guess, our guess, our best guesses that we started the year with. My prediction. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, now you're going to call it a prediction. (laughs) Yeah, because I'm right. (laughs) (laughs) The U.S. and other countries will adopt privacy and data security regulations that will resemble the EU GDPR. See, told you. (laughs) (laughs) My organization will increase its investment in big data analytics for cyber defense. That is for big companies, and we hope that'll filter down to the little ones. Yeah, it'll be a while. Big data analytics is cutting edge, expensive stuff. Sharing of threat intelligence will become a more valuable tool in our organization's security, Austin. And I can tell you from experience, it is very frustrating when people, you know they know, and they are not telling you because they feel they need to hide the information. It's another organization. You know they know everything you need to know about a specific attack to work with your problem, and they won't tell you because we're not allowed. And, you know, their contractors are told, no, you can't tell anybody. My organization will increasingly rely upon managed service providers to help improve its security posture. Booyah! Booyah! <laughs> There you go. Mr. Sims is a happy man. So these are all things that we've talked about before, but clearly the message is not getting through between watching the uh, uh, broadcasters on the news. I'm still astonished at, at the lack of understanding about such a major problem that we've been talking about now since 2016, unless they were just pretending to be that, you know, to get in touch with their viewers who didn't understand. That can also happen. But anyway, but we got that. I mean, clearly, we don't have the luxury of, of moving on to other topics because people aren't listening. You know, it's it, all of these studies say the same thing. People better be paying attention. This is going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Well, as you said, it'll get worse before it gets better. Some things will improve, but how much damage is going to be done before we, you know, when can we plow the fields again after they've been destroyed? Yeah. Well, it's the un- unfortunate thing that, like most things in life, you don't want to protect yourself until it happens. And then you want to protect yourself. That's what they say. 
You know, it's like the CISO who was quoted when he said that the best way to get disaster recovery funding in your office is to make sure the office across the street burns down. Yeah. You know, that's how you'll get it. That's the only way you'll get it sometimes. It's unfortunate, but, you know, enough offices are burning down around us that, as you said, everything happens in Georgia. That's why I guess we're busy. <laughs> Maybe that's it. To people from other states who are like, hey, let's let's get ahead of the game. Let's get somebody from Georgia. Yeah. Bring me in. I, 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 while we were recording, I got a text message from one of my uh, clients who has retired saying, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I'm watching the news. The city of Atlanta needs you. Go down there. <laughs> the city of Atlanta needs you. <laughs> I'm like, ah, ah. <laughs> She thought she was funny. Because <laughs> she is. <laughs> she knows I ain't doing that. Yeah. So, no, they're under attack. You're not going down there. <laughs> city of Atlanta's under attack. Oh, no. Yep. All right, buddy. All right, that's it. That's awesome stuff, though. I have to say, I like all the uh, things that show my predictions are correct and that MSPs are going to be busy. <laughs> I know. You're living right, brother. Living the dream. So, all right. It is scary. They sound scary. Yeah, it is scary. All right, folks. Well, that's our show for today. And remember to follow us on social media and share us out. You know, take advantage of us, whatever you need to do. <laughs> Rate us on your favorite podcasting app. Uh, we need your help spreading the word. And always uh, remember that you can send us questions at contact at helpmewithhipa.com. We might even feature those in a future broadcast. So remember for Donna and myself that HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.